Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Genesis Part 2 Bible Study. We're joined this week by Pastor Casey Shirley. Casey, how you doing? I'm doing super. Yeah, really well. How are you, Caleb? I'm doing great. Okay. I'm, I'm excited for another week to dive in this text and learn from all of you guys like I do every week. Um, not just me learning this week too, but we also have our Zoom crew with us again. We got Noah, Jordan, DJ, and Lacey joining us from online to study Genesis 37 through 38. Yeah. We've just got two chapters this week. We're keeping it, we're keeping it short. So Yeah. I can definitely, I know that's definitely helped with my workload. Sometimes I, I leave these with so many questions, so much knowledge, ready for the teaching. Um, and this week's no different. Mm-hmm. Um, I know last week we we kind of closed the Jacob narrative. We saw that Isaac died. We saw that Rachel died. We had uh, one more kid in Jacob's family, Benjamin. Uh, and then we also spent the end of, or the whole chapter of 36, kind of getting a little bit of an update on, on Esau's lineage. You know, we spent mm-hmm. so much time on Jacob, the scripture was like, hey, here's what's going on with Esau. Mm-hmm. Where do we go here? I mean, we, we kind of sunsetted the the Jacob narrative, and now it seems like we're stepping into something new. We actually are. So if you remember from Genesis part one, we would talk about how the chapter numbers were added later. Mm-hmm. So we know that we're moving on in the narrative. We're moving into a new section or a new chapter um, by the words, these are the generations of dot, dot, dot. So mm-hmm. um, in Genesis 37, two, you read that these are the generations of Jacob. So just to preface this, verse one says, Jacob lived in the land of his father's sojournings, in the land of Canaan. So we know where we're at. These are the generations of Jacob. So this is actually the 10th time, and that's really significant. Um, the number 10 is significant in Hebrew literature, mm-hmm. and um, it's the last time this phrase is used in Genesis. Interesting. So it is interesting because we're in chapter 37. We still got quite a ways to go. So Joseph yeah. actually takes up the story of Joseph, which we're going to get to here in just a second, actually takes up the majority of Genesis. He's the most talked about. He, he, the most time is dedicated to Joseph. In, Ge- awesome. in Genesis, yeah. It means we're getting to a big portion, huh? Yeah. Oh, yeah. This is going to be really informative for, it would have been informative for the ancient Israelites. It's going to be very informative for us. It's almost like we're not moving on from the patriarchs. Like they're still there in the background, mm-hmm. but in a sense, this is a new beginning. Mm-hmm. So we're not like we've kind of wrapped up this. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob storyline. And now, I mean, Jacob's still alive, so he's still there, but yeah. really the primary focus is on Joseph. So our our main human character is is shifting. Oh, the main yeah. person that we're spotlighting. Obviously, mm-hmm. you mm-hmm. know, this is a story about God. This is mm-hmm. this is a book about God, but our human, I guess, person that we're following is, is Moving on from the patriarch, so to speak? Yeah, a little bit, because Joseph isn't one of those like named mm-hmm. pa- patriarchs, but also we'll... I don't know if I want to spoil it, but we're looking for that snake-crushing seed. Mm-hmm. So really, the intent of this narrative is the preservation of that mm-hmm. snake-crushing seed. I see. But um, but is that Joseph? Yeah, I know that's the kind of the question that I've been asking myself I mean, every I, time we I get into person. I think we're actually going to get to the answer of that by the end of tonight. Okay, we'll, cool. we'll know for sure. So, I'll, I'll, I'll make sure to circle back. We'll yeah, <laughs> we'll we'll find it. So before we jump into kind of unpacking Genesis thirty-seven, I want to ask you. I want to ask our Zoom participants: What's one question that you had about this chapter, or even one observation that you had about this chapter about? Um, the people who are presented, the situations that are presented. Um, what are a couple things that you guys noticed that you'd like to share? Yeah, I I know for me, it was hard to try and put myself in the situation of Joseph and his brothers. Um, Joseph had to be, it seems like, pretty arrogant for his brothers to go so far as to say, let's kill him. You know, I have a younger brother who's about four years younger than me. And, you know, he means the world to me. And so I just can't imagine 
them getting to a place and then what actions they end up do taking to do those things to Joseph. Like it makes me just think like how arrogant or how big headed did he have to sound to those guys or maybe how just evil the older brothers were. Um, but man, I sat and thought about that for a while. Yeah. I could see it being definitely a little bit of both. Yeah, for sure. Um, based on their previous behavior last week, we see that they are capable of some really serious, mm. well, I mean, slaughtering. Yeah, some of, atrocities. Oh, man. Yeah. So, I, yeah, I think that's definitely something that the text wants you to say, wait a second, is this the way that things are supposed to be? It doesn't seem like the optimal relationship. Mm. It doesn't seem like what God intended in right. Genesis 1 and 2 for relationships to be like between mm -hmm. people and people who call each other family. That doesn't really, doesn't really line up. Anybody else have any observations, questions about 37? No, I just piggyback off of Noah. You know, I, I'm the oldest of, of five brothers and sisters. And if the younger one had favoritism and it was kind of blatant like that, and they would have, uh, said they were going to be ruling over me or I was going to be underneath them. That was kind of, I, I seen where they were coming from, not to the point of, of killing them, but it still stirred something up in me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Okay. Well, with that said, we know that there's something, there's some relational tension going on here. Let's look at these verses. Um, it says, Joseph um, being 17 years old, was pasturing the flock with his brothers. He was a boy um, with the sons of Bilhah and Zilpah, his father's wives. Um, and Joseph brought a bad report of them to their father. So just right off the bat, we know he's 17. He's hanging out with his brothers, but Rachel is his mom. Bilhah and Zilpah are the... They're the, the maid, the maid servants, servants. Yeah. who are also, you know, have born children. And he's hanging out with them. Mm -hmm. uh, he brought a bad report to them, of them, to their father. Some of the language here kind of implies that he's lording over them a little mm -hmm. bit. Um, he's he's being a little bit of a, a jerk, maybe. And so... And, Is this like tattletaling? Absolutely. Mm. Absolutely tattletaling. And then even if he's kind well, it's likely that he's younger, but he's the son, he's the favored son mm -hmm. of the favored wife. And so he, yeah, he's taking some liberties here, I think, <laughs> with his brothers. And so in verse three, it says, Now Israel, who is Jacob, loved Joseph more than any other of his sons, because he was the son of his old age. And what do you guys think about that? Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other sons. Where where have we seen favoritism before? And kind of how has that worked out in the past? What do you guys think? Where where have we seen it? Even the most obvious example. Abraham. Abraham. He, mm -hmm. Yeah, he favored uh his firstborn, for yeah, sure. Yeah, he he favored Ishmael, and then well, who did who favored Jacob? Rebecca. Rebecca favored Jacob, yeah, and then Isaac favored Esau. Mm -hmm. So we, yeah, we saw that too. So there's a lot of like people picking their favorites. Yeah, and I just don't like. I know that that's not doesn't seem to be the character of God. Like God mm. doesn't pick favorites. Yeah, or he's not. His favoritism, <clears throat> excuse me, his favoritism isn't to the exclusion of others. Mm, and so yeah. when we see where we see favoritism from parents to children, we also see God electing individuals for his sovereign purposes and the benefit of many. Mm. So we see kind of a corrupt version of what God is doing, um, where humanity has a tendency to just kind of twist things to um, to lo look a little bit like God, but it really gets a, a terrible result. Mm -hmm. And it's just that idea of God, what He had on offer in the Garden of Eden 
we've taken and we've tried to do it our own way in our own wisdom, mm -hmm. and we do a bad job without him. It's pretty, pretty bad. <laughs> so <laughs> it doesn't go well. I, but I feel like that's a that's a theme we've seen, you know, since Genesis three mm -hmm. is is this this continual us kind of trying to humanity trying to mm -hmm. take matters in our own hands and yeah we like we know you know this idea of we know what's up we know how to do things we got it we got our own control like God's little, there but we got it a little stuff. prideful yeah actually a lot prideful <laughs> a lot prideful so in verse five we see now Joseph had a dream and when he told it to his brothers they hated him even more so they hated oh we skipped we skipped one of the most important parts this is the part that everybody like we're talking about if you're talking about Joseph you're talking about his robe of many colors oh yeah um, and then, but when his brothers saw their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peacefully to him, or they could not like shalom, like they couldn't like, like live, they couldn't live in peace, right yeah. relationship with him. It was like, something is broken here. Something is broken here. And, and Jacob has some culpability in this thing. Mm -hmm. So, um, in verse five, it says, now Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. So we've got hate on top of hate. And he said to them, man, guys, here, I'm just like, Joseph, shh. Okay. So he says, hear this dream that I have dreamed. Behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and behold, a sheaf arose and stood upright, and behold, your sheaves gathered around it and bowed down to my sheaf. And his brother said to him, are you indeed to reign over us or are you indeed to rule over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. Now, I'm going to ask you guys a question. Can you, is there anything when I say this reign and rule, when I say this, is there any previous narrative in Genesis thinking all the way back to the beginning that this reminds you of? All the way back to the beginning. That's a hint. Yeah, we were told that we were going to reign over the earth. I mean, that was what our, our job was from the beginning, was to reign over everything. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so are we intended to, like, reign and rule and to the, like, in, and to dominate other people? No, I mean, it's supposed to be this shalom kind of deal, yeah. like this peaceful kind of deal where we're all in cooperation with each other yeah. as one family wow. ruling and reigning over creation. And so the interesting thing about his dream is that Yahweh, God, is absent from it, and he is the central figure mm -hmm. of it. Now, I don't think that that means that I think the dream is has a little bit of like Jacob's or Joseph's ego in it for sure. And I think yeah. it is indicative of something that's going to happen. Mm -hmm. But should he have shared this dream? I mean, he's Yeah. We get no mention of of Yahweh saying, No, go and tell your brothers <laughs> yeah. that they are going to bow down. I mean, listen, Joseph's 17. It wasn't too long ago that I that I was that age, and man, I can just imagine if some some younger guy came up to me and was like, "Yeah, you know, actually, the Lord told me that you guys are all going to serve me, and yeah, I'm going to employ all of you guys, and I'll be good to you guys." It I feels, would, it, ooh, <laughs> that would churn my gears, honestly. It really would. It feels a little a little preemptive, you yeah. know. Like I don't know. Do you guys have any thoughts about that? About his, or we can, I don't know. Well, he just like like it says from the beginning of this chapter, he he's a tattletale. He's going and, and telling all his brothers. He, he's he he knows what he's doing in this moment. In my eyes, he he's getting at him. He's poking the bear per se. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Oh, that's good. Yeah, poking the bear is a good idea. Yeah. Um. So he has another dream, mm -hmm. which is interesting because in the Joseph narrative. And throughout Genesis, but specifically here, dreams come in pairs, so there's more dreams to come. Yeah. But this is just setting the precedent for this for the second dream. It adds validity to the first. Mm -hmm. There might be one dream. Oh, that was weird. I had weird, like I had pizza, and yeah. you know. 
But two dreams, that's meaning something. And so he dreamed another dream and told it to his brothers and said, Behold, I have dreamed another dream. (laughs) Behold, the sun, the moon, and eleven stars were bowing down to me. But when he told it to his father, so this time his father's in on it, and his brothers, his father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall I and your mother and your brothers indeed come to bow ourselves down or to the ground before you? And his brothers were jealous of him. But his father kept this saying in mind. So I think that this is interesting. And I and I have to ask myself, does Jacob suspect that his favoritism of Joseph has actually ruined his mm. his favorite son? Is he like, oh man? Like you've spoiled him. Yeah. Does he does he think that it's ruined him, or maybe does he think if I don't rebuke him now in front of his brothers, like then there's just going to be havoc, like it's yeah. going to be all out war. Hmm. So the first dream represents this agricultural reality. It's more like down to earth, but the second dream like moves up to the heavens. It has like spiritual implications. So um, theologian Robert Alter says, from a strict monotheistic view, the second dream actually teeters on the brink of blasphemy. Hmm. So he's like right on the edge with what he's saying. And again, he is the central figure in this dream. He's hmm. he's the, the big guy here, which is, I, I can see it. I can see that tension. Mm. So um, where where were Joseph's dreams from the Lord? I mean, we see, as, as we read this, this is meditation literature. So a lot of people are approaching this story for, um, for the second time, for the 10th time, or whatever. They know what's coming. They know what's going to happen. So they know that God is clearly up to something. Right. but. Based on Joseph's interpretations, he is the center of these dreams, mm-hmm. not Yahweh. So, well, yeah, I, I, that's I mean, we, we don't necessarily get that answer of like if these are from God or not. Mm-mm. We don't. And I think it's something that we're supposed to think about. And our like literal Western minds want that answer. We mm-hmm. want to understand that. But the intent of this is to just kind of like, mull over it and see and see the work of God kind of coming to the surface throughout yeah. the narrative. So if if meditation literature is not necessarily to give us our black and white answers, what is the purpose of meditating on this? I, it is to form us and to shape us, mm. to see what God is like and to see how God relates to humanity, how he works with humanity, often in spite of us and even through our failures. And so, yeah, it's it's intended to form us and mm. to shape us. Um, and it's such a gift. Yeah. So um, I, I do want to say this. If we think about this coat of many colors— what what was this indicative of? So we do the. Just let me clarify this. They don't know for sure that this was like a striped coat, like we kind yeah. of tend to think about, like the Veggie Tales version of this <laughs> um, is it's very colorful. But it could have been set apart by its sleeves. It could have been like the mm-hmm. the idea of it being a robe of many colors is actually a rendering from the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament. Okay. So that's what that's what they came up that's what translators came up right. with. So they're doing their best but, with yeah. with the what they've got as far as words are concerned. So, but the idea is like this is a special coat. Of some, yeah. It's not this isn't your normal run of the mill go grab some water feed the camels coat. Totally. This is my parents Gave me all hand me downs and took my younger sister. Okay, I don't, this is gonna be <laughs> revealing my age a little bit, but Abercrombie and Fitch was like yeah. the big deal. I wore Abercrombie and Fitch. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. like, if they took my little sister to Abercrombie and Fitch <laughs> and I got hand me downs, that's what this would be like. I see. Yeah. 
Yeah. She was like with the special bedazzled jeans and Yes. Was that a thing back then? There was a there was a small era where bedazzled jeans were like really in oh. at Abercrombie. Wow. I mean, yes, maybe. Early two thousands. Come on. Or, yeah, come on, somebody. <laughs> Let's not go back. So so Joseph has this Beda- bedazzled coat. All oh, right, yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> or this special, but yeah. you mean all jokes aside, this, this so, special oh, favoritism coat of some sort. Yeah. What is so? If we think about this in context of if he's going to rule and reign, yeah. um, and we look at what God desires from someone who is going to rule and reign, we're always going to look at Jesus. Mm. And when you think about this coat representing his identity and then you look forward to Jesus mm-hmm. would it like in John 13 we see Jesus actually taking off his outer garment mm. and taking on the form of a servant and and getting down and washing feet and serving. And so is that shift yeah. going to happen? Like, I think the only way for Joseph that this is actually going to take place is if something radical happens in his understanding of what it means to rule mm-hmm. and reign on behalf of other people, yeah. like, and for their good and for, and to, in order to bless them. Yeah. So, um, okay. So now we move on to verse 12. Now his brothers went to pasture their father's flock near Shechem. Uh Uh-oh. Shechem. Getting close. Yeah. It's dangerous territory. And Israel. (laughs) Yeah, especially now. (laughs) Yeah. And Israel said to Joseph, are not your brothers pasturing the flock at Shechem? Come, I will send you to them. And he said to them, here I am. So he said to him, go now, see if it is well with your brothers, with the flock, bring me word. So he sent him from the valley of Hebron and he came to Shechem. Okay, cool. So he's worried about him. He sends Joseph out to check on them. They're probably not super thrilled about this, but but he's he's been sent. So in yeah. verse 15... We see, and a man found him wandering in the fields, and the man asked him, what are you seeking? And I am seeking my brothers, he said. And then he said, tell me, please, where are they pasturing the flock? And the man said, they have gone away, for I have heard them say, let's go to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them at Dothan. So just a quick, just something to ponder. Where did this mysterious man come from? Where did this, where, like, what do we think? Who do we think he might be based on where we've seen just men appear in Genesis previously? What, what could be going on here? Are are you teasing out that this could be some kind of divine agent? Possibly. Or it could be a guy walking in a field. Yeah. But where we just see like unnamed men show up in the past, it's mm-hmm. been pretty meaningful. Hmm. DJ? Yeah. Can you- not only that, it, it kind of reminds me of a, a different part later in, in this in scripture where he's asking the question, what are you looking for? That immediately took me to, uh, I think it's when the two guys are walking and Jesus shows up and asks them what they, what do they want? Or what are they, what are they? What are you seeking? Yeah, absolutely. In the gospel of John, he does that at the beginning. He's like, what are you seeking? Or, um, that's good, DJ. That's a, yeah, that question should kind of like have some alarm bells go go off for you for sure. So they saw him from afar. How did they recognize him from far away? His coat. (laughs) The bedazzled coat. He's wearing his sweet coat. Yeah. (laughs) So they looked out there and they said, oh, wow, he found us. Mm. We thought that we just got to be out here. Yeah. It's and like you're trying to ditch your kid brother and you're like, oh, man. Yeah, man, God. But it gives them some time. They recognize him and it and before they came near, they conspired against him to kill him. Oh. And they said to one another, Here comes this dreamer. So this is so derogatory. Here comes this dreamer. Mm. And um I did think that we tend to make light of the things that we are most threatened by. Mm. And so I suspect that they were threatened by. Joseph, by his coat that meant favoritism, but it also could have implied authority of some kind. And so, yeah, you see this um, this push pull. And so, yeah, they they are to that point that you were 
kind of talking about, come now, let us kill him and throw him into one of the pits. Then we will say that a fierce animal has devoured him, and we will see what will become of his dreams. Oh, man. But when Reuben heard it, he rescued him out of their hands, saying, let us not take his life. And Reuben said to them, shed no blood. This is a big deal. Shed no blood. Throw him into this pit here in the wilderness, but do not lay a hand on him so that he might rescue him out of their hand to restore him to his father. So why would Reuben, do we have any thoughts on why Reuben would would want to save Joseph? Any thoughts? Yeah. yeah. Oh, Jordan, go ahead. I was, yeah, I, I was thinking about this throughout the week. Um, and I, I just... The the last time we heard of Reuben doing something was the uh, ordeal with um, his stepmom mm-hmm. with Bilha. Mm-hmm. And I, I I was thinking, is this an attempt by Reuben to t- to kind of get back in the good graces of his father and maybe sort of repair any sort of tension that was there because of uh, because of that wrongdoing and perhaps perhaps if. If he can come to Jacob and say, hey, I just rescued your favorite son. Like, can I be back? Like, can I be back in the good in the good place now? Can can we be on good terms again um, because I've done this? Yeah, Jordan, I actually tend to agree with you on that. I think that's a really good observation. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think that's pro- very likely his motivation. Mm-hmm. Um, saving the favorite son is, I yeah. mean, it could definitely win him points. Yeah, but I, th- I think it changes. I when I had read this previously, I understood it as Reuben. Okay, Reuben's being the good guy now. Mm. Like he's standing in the gap for his brother. Mm. He's a defender. And I think having actually read before that exactly the same story you guys are seeing, his intentions maybe aren't as pure now. Mm-hmm. They aren't mm-hmm. as aren't, it, he's not being necessarily this big brother because of. His love, brotherly love. It's oh, to- yeah, something else. Totally, yeah, it is something else. And we'll and we'll see that he says something that makes you think, huh? What? What were you thinking there? So, verse twenty three says, "So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the robe of many colors that he wore. So they forcibly took it off of him, and they took him and threw him into a pit. The pit was empty; there was no water in it. And then they sat down to eat. That seems weird." We just threw our brother in a pit, and now we need a snack. Yeah. I mean... It's a lot of work. It is a lot of work to conspire to kill your younger brother. Mm -hmm. Um, I kind of think, like, they're so relieved. Like, their problem is gone. Mm. And they're like, okay. It's like a callousness, too. Yeah. Like, it's callousness. Like, thank God he's out of here. Like, he's... We're done with this. Now we can eat in peace Mm. because our problem, the thorn in our side, is gone. Um, It's been the thing that's been causing them irritation they've dealt with. Mm. Um, So, and looking up. So there's this idea of looking up. They saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead with their camels bearing gum, balm, and myrrh on their way to carry it down to Egypt. So Ishmaelites... Who so we this is a fam- should be a familiar name to us. Um, then Judah said to his brothers, "What profit is it if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Now come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites, and let not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother in our own flesh." And his brothers listened to him. Then Midianite traders passed by, and they drew Joseph up, lifted him out of the pit, and sold him to the Ishmaelites for twenty shekels of silver, and they took. Joseph to Egypt. So um, there's still like, what we're doing here is we're connected. Like all these people are still connected. Like this is their great, great uncle something. I don't know. They're related. Like there, there's something, there's something that the author wants us to see here that all of this is is one story that's kind of weaving together and um he wants us to pay attention. So mm-hmm. for some reason Reuben left like he said let's not kill him and then he left and then they made mm. this plan Judah made this plan and then Reuben comes back 
we don't to- it's not totally clear what happened. It's kind of strange. It's kind of cryptic, but mm-hmm. He returned to the pit, and he saw that Joseph was not in the pit. He tore his clothes, and he returned to his brothers and said, The boy is gone, and I, where shall I go? So he is, like, focused on himself. Like, he's not, he's, and he calls him the boy. He's saying, the boy is gone, and Mm -hmm. I, where shall I go? Where am I going to go if I'm not, if, if we come back and the and I'm not bringing the favored son, then I'm out of luck. Mm-hmm. Um, and then they took Joseph's robe, slaughtered a goat, and dipped the robe in blood. And they sent the robe of many colors and brought it to their father and said, this we have found. Please identify whether it is your son's robe or not. So this is kind of weird, like complicated language because... It says they sent the robe of many colors and brought it to their father. And then it says, this we have found. Please identify whether it is your son's robe or not. So they're not physically bringing the robe Hmm. to their father. They're not present. They sent the robe and somebody else has brought it to him. The messenger, probably whatever. Yeah. Yeah. So what's interesting is he identified the robe and the sons aren't there to tell the story. They allow the robe to tell the story and he fills in all the blanks for himself. And so a fierce animal has devoured him. Joseph is without doubt torn to pieces. And so he, he fills in the blanks for all of this, but What's interesting is that this isn't this is kind of a turn like so where did Jacob deceive and use a garment to deceive and kill an animal to deceive um previously in this mm-hmm. narrative when he was stealing the blessing from Esau right. and you and deceiving Isaac to get it and so this is actually, it's happening to him. Um, and all the blanks are, he's filling in all the blanks himself. So pretty interesting. Yeah. It's, it, it's a parallel with his life. life. Yeah. You start to see as you're moving through this narrative, like you start to make all these connections yeah. to previous and like previous times in the story. Mm-hmm. And it's pretty cool. Um, so in verse 34, then Jacob tore his garments and put sackcloth on his loins and mourned for his son for many days. All his sons and all his daughters rose up to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted and said, No, I shall go down to Sheol with my son to my son mourning. So he's like the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. I'm until, yeah, until I die, Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm never going to be comforted. None of you can comfort me. because my favorite son is gone. Um, thus his father wept for him. Meanwhile, (laughs) which is pretty awesome. Uh, I don't know. Like I just see these two scenes taking place like Like in the show. Oh yeah, yeah. Or like in 24. I don't know if you know this show mm-hmm. at all, but at the end they have like, this is happening over here. Like, and then this is happening over here. And so I just see these two scenes kind of playing yeah. side by side. So Jacob this morning. Yeah. I definitely see like the panoramic shot of him on his knees going like, why? And the black screen of meanwhile and these yeah. caravan traders. Yeah. Or it's like that end credits in like Marvel movies and stuff. Mm-hmm. That's good. That is good. Okay. So, <laughs> so meanwhile, the, <laughs> the Midianites had sold him in Egypt to Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the guard. Um, whoa. Yeah. Big stuff happening. But then we like move to chapter 38 and it's really like it's a hard left turn or it feels like a hard left turn. Mm-hmm. And yeah. Is this just like an error? Is there, are we missing stories here? Like no. what's going on? I know it's weird. So what we're going to find is that in chapter 38, we actually see um, this condensed version of what happens in Joseph's story. Hmm. So you'll recognize these things. Like it's just a very condensed um, 
So you'll see these cues. We're going to look at some um, that yeah. actually happen. It, se it seems so confusing. Like, this is out of the blue. We've taken a sharp left turn. But then there's also this idea that Judah is, he becomes really important further down the line. Mm. And so this is saying, like, you can't negate this guy's importance. He becomes a leader further on down in the narrative. He is, he is the representative for the family in many ways. Mm. And so, um, yeah, we'll, we'll see that. We'll talk about it a little bit more. Yeah. But I do want to ask you guys, when you first read this chapter, um, what were your like? What what was your first re reaction to this? What was your as you were thinking about this chapter this week? Um, what were some of the questions that were going through your minds? What were some of the observations that you were making? What stood out to you? What just seemed really weird? Give me a give me a little bit of what you guys thought. Just feel like I read my everyday life with our four children, and it was so annoying. <laughs> if I'm just really honest, all the bickering, all the fighting, all the tattling, he said, she said, the manipulation, the trying to be better um, in someone else's eyes. Um, you know, we live that life as parents. So uh, that's that's what I feel. From this, like who who's the one upper? Like I feel like that's just what this whole chapter was. Was yeah, I'm totally. gonna. I'm gonna, like they're all trying to one up each other just to be the best in their father's eyes. So if you are Judah, what are you thinking? Like I think it's interesting that after this whole thing that Judah says. And it happened at that time that Judah went down from his brothers and turned aside to a certain Adulamite whose name was Hira. And it's like, why? And I think that you're onto something. He was done. He was like, we've gone too far. We've done too much. I think I'm done with this family. Like, mm. I'm getting away. And you see that also in that he marries this Canaanite woman. Um I mean, and you're not supposed to do that. Abraham expressly told his servant, like, hey, I don't want yeah. Isaac to marry a Canaanite woman, so go back to my hometown. And so, yeah, I think that that is so appropriate, especially for where Judah's at in this whole thing. Like, he saw his, like, he's part of slaughtering a whole group of people, and then he's part of profiting from selling his little brother. Right. And uh yeah, and then it, in verse 2, it says there Judah saw the daughter of a certain Canaanite whose name was Shua, he took her and went into her and she conceived and bore a son and he called her his name Er Er. er. What a name. Um mm -hmm. so you see that see and take, see and take. Where do we see that? That's the cycle of sin. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you see that with Eve, yeah. she sees and she takes. Yeah. Shechem saw and he took. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so he's doing the same thing. Um, and then it says she conceived and bore again and bore a son, and she called his name Onan. Yet again, she bore a son, and she called his name Shela, Shela. Um, Judah was in Chezeb when she bore him. Mm -hmm. So... Um, yeah, we're we're in a situation here. We're looking at the life of Judah. He wants to get away from <laughs> he wants to get away from his brothers. Um and then he this is a whole like this has got to be a, a pretty extensive passage of time. Mm -hmm. Um he goes down, get like marries a woman, um, has three sons, and then we see him um taking a wife for his firstborn, and right. her name was Tamar. Um Judah's firstborn was wicked in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord put him to death. Mm. So yeah, that's that's it's a light passage. <laughs> super light. Yeah. Well we don't get any details around exactly like what happened with Ur. Did mm -hmm. we don't know exactly what the wickedness was mm -hmm. that he he perpetrated. Now, if we think about it, can you guys think of the other times where God responds 
um, to wickedness. There's two other times in Genesis where God sees wickedness and he's like, I have to do something about this. Can you get, do you guys know? Caleb, do you know? Have- wait, wait, we'll give him a second to see. Noah, do you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. Was, he wanted to clean the earth and he told Noah to build a boat. And, um, but yeah, he was ready to start afresh, start all over again and start up again with Noah. Yeah. Yeah. He saw the wickedness and he saw that every thought of their hearts was evil. Like the intent of their hearts was evil all the time. So yeah, right on. There's one more time. Do you guys know which one it is? It comes in the Abraham narrative. Yeah, was it Sodom and Gomorrah? It was. It was Sodom and Gomorrah. Mm-hmm. So that's the other time that he talks about this wickedness. So there is an association though of like him seeing and seeing wickedness. And then if you think about Eve, like she saw the fruit and she decided to for herself like she saw the tree of the knowledge of good and evil yeah. and then she saw that it was good hmm. so this is this idea of like we're not the best judges of you yeah. know the like hardest deceitful above all else like, yeah like yeah. we're not the best judges but god is the righteous judge hmm. and so when he looks and he sees something he, he and he feels like i have to do something about this but we also know that he is slow to anger mm-hmm. like if we think about his name as he reveals himself in exodus 34 he is slow to anger he is patient and so this is probably something that's been going on for for an extended period of time he's not just like oh you did you know Right. You did something. Um, so, yeah. This is, yeah. I mean, it's the, uh, you know, if you do not turn and repent kind of thing of like mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. opportunity after opportunity. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Rebellion yeah. after rebellion. After rebellion. Yeah. 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 God is always approaching people with grace mm-hmm. and grace hardens some and it softens others. Mm-hmm. Whew. Come on. Okay, so verse eight, (laughs) then Judah said to Onan, go into your brother's wife and perform the duty of a brother-in-law to her and raise up offspring for your brother. But Onan knew that the offspring would not be his. So whenever he went into his brother's wife, he would waste the semen on the ground so that as not to give offspring to his brother. And what he did was wicked in the sight of the Lord, and he put him to death also. Whoa, that seems like pretty quick. So I have two questions. Yeah. I have, I have, and they might be the same question. I don't okay. Know. Um, so one, why, why was he supposed to marry his brother's wife? Yeah. And why would their kids be the, you know, the deceased brothers? Mm-hmm. Why would he, why would they not be? Cause I know like. Okay. Okay. I'll let you. Yeah. Go ahead. No, it's okay. It's great. It's great. <laughs> um, so in the future, there's this. In, when there's the giving of the law, right. there's something called the Leverite marriage. Mm-hmm. So, um, but that's not that hasn't happened yet. So you're like, where this is a, this is not a thing mm-hmm. in for for Israel, that time for yeah. that time. But there were some like ancient Near Eastern customs. There was a Hittite custom where you would actually do something like that, mm. um, where you would provide an heir for your deceased brother. Mm. Um, and then the the child would actually receive the inheritance of the eldest of the eldest son. I see. And so Onan, what could his motives be for not wanting to provide an heir. He doesn't want like a diminished inheritance. Yeah, because that would again split the portion of his father. So, yeah. yeah, yeah. So him, every time he is um, not fulfilling that mm-hmm. and choosing instead to like serve himself mm-hmm. in that moment, he it's essentially like he's he's committing incest mm-hmm. um, because he's not doing like what yeah. he has... Like with selfish intent for selfish, selfish in- gain. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, but to give some context to this idea of leave right marriage, um, there's a passage that talks about it specifically in Deuteronomy. And it says, if brothers dwell together and one of them dies and has no son, the wife of the dead man shall not be married outside the family to a stranger. Mm. Her husband's brother shall go into her and take her as a wife and perform. 
perform the duty of a husband's brother yeah. to her, and the first son whom she bears shall succeed to the name of the dead brother, gotcha. that his name might not be blotted out of Israel. So ah, I see. Yeah. all of this so, is a thing, but then they do have this thing where if you are the younger brother and you say no, mm-hmm. then the widow has a right to take off your sandal and spit in your face. I that's not funny, but it's bo- supposed to be this incredibly shameful yeah. experience because it's just weird to me. So what does that represent? Cuz nowadays if someone comes up, takes off my sandal, spit my, I'm like spits in my face. Yeah. I'm offended. Yeah. But I'm not like I'm going to forget it. I mean, yeah. I might tell a story about it later. Okay, but. I will say this that the feet in the in the scriptures are associated with with the I don't like I mean, they didn't have like shoes, right? So it's like no. Real dirty. I have to say, I don't know. Do we want to backtrack a little bit? No, <laughs> I just want to say that the sandals have some um, significance to what it would be a, like mean to procreate. Okay, there's like a tie there between procreation and the feet specifically in scripture. Gotcha. Weird. Yeah. Can I just but it's say, just, it's cultural. the Bible is so weird. So it's like, but it's like a cultural it custom is cultural. understanding. Yes. Okay. So I they see. would take the shoe, they would take the sandal off and they would give it to the magistrate. So it was like this forever, like My the brother wasn't going to fulfill his duty. Mm. And so they, it's like a legally binding thing. And the widow gets to shame him. What essentially this is saying is that it's protecting the widow. It's protecting the vulnerable. So she's the one who's kind of put out by this situation, mm-hmm. and the law is set in place so that she has some way to, you know, like... Yeah, still, I mean, it's a lot like uh, we saw with uh, Laban's daughters. There's the whole thing of like, with uh, when Rachel hadn't had kids yet. Yeah. Was yeah, like yeah, like, yeah. I need to have mm-hmm, kids mm-hmm, that way. I mm-hmm. actually There's, have a life. And... It's so it's very meaningful. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Mm. So, um, verse eleven. Do you guys have any thoughts? You just think it's weird. I mean, it's real weird. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but um, it's it's meaningful. It's meaningful. Um, so verse eleven says, "Then Judah said to Tamar, his daughter-in-law, remain a widow in your father's house till Shelah, my son, grows up." Uh, for he feared that he would die like his brother. So he lies to her and but because he's afraid. So Tamar went and remained in her father's house. Um, she's living in there, but she's living in her father's house, but she's still under the authority of her father-in-law. Mm-hmm. So this is this is not a great situation right. um, for her. She's basically in prison, essentially. Mm-hmm. Like she can't do anything. She can't really go anywhere. So it says, in the course of time, the wife of Judah, she was daughter died. And when Judah was comforted, so when he was done with his mourning, like you have this Jacob wouldn't be comforted, wouldn't wouldn't move on with his life. Here you have Judah comforted, mm-hmm. and he went up to Timnah with his sh- to his sheep shears and his friend Hira the Adulamite. So uh, Hira the Adulamite showed up at the beginning of this chapter, and I feel like he's a bad influence. <laughs> I don't know. Like he kind of shows up throughout. DJ, I see you agreeing with me. Yeah. So he kind of shows up throughout. And um, then there's the sheep shearing, which is also scandalous. So essentially, this is like um, the bad, like the friend who is the bad influence, like the lackey or the. I don't know, like that guy you know you should not hang out with because every time you do, you do something so stupid. Um, <laughs> and so this, I just want to read what it says about the sheep shearers. This is this is essentially Vegas. So one commentary <laughs> says this season, which occurs in Palestine towards the end of March, was spent in more than usual hilarity, and the wealthiest masters invited their friends as well as treated their servants to sumptuous entertainments. Mm. Accordingly, it is said that Judah was accompanied by his friend Hira. So, or, yeah. So, it's party time. Yeah. He's feeling better, but his wife also died. So, he's like, let's go. Let's go party with with the sheep shearers. And he takes his friend. Yeah. 
So this is, yeah, this is like a celebrate. This is him celebrating almost whenever someone else is in mourning or him. Well, no, having... I mean, he was in mourning. Mm-hmm. He was in mourning. He's just like, it's, we're, we're okay. done now. It's over. Gotcha. And so I'm ready to, I think I'm ready to party. Mm. Yeah. He's like, I'm over this. Um, so verse 13 says, and when Tamar was told your father's going up to Timna, she, to shear his sheep, she's like, oh, okay. Is when my window of opportunity. So she took off her widow's garments. This is important. She has been mourning for Onan for all this time, for for a widow, for an undisclosed amount of time. But she also knows that Shua or um, where is it? That so she we'll get there. So she takes off her widow's garments, covers herself with a veil, wrapping herself up, sat at the entrance of Enaim, which is on the road to Timnah, for she saw that Shela, that's his name, was grown up, and she had not been given to him in mm. marriage. So this is, I mean, what Judah did was shameful. This She should have been able to take a sandal and spit in his face, that kind of thing. Right. Like, he wasn't fulfilling... Um, the familial yeah. du- duty by giving um, Tamar mm-hmm. his youngest son, and it had been a long time. I mean, the, we don't know how it'd much, but time. he the the fact that it says he had grown up like that's a that's a yeah. year multiple that's multiple yeah. years, and she is until she marries him. She is in that widowhood. Hmm. She is in that like liminal space yeah. of like how do I go on with my life? So, in verse fifteen. When Judah saw her, she th- he thought she was a prostitute. She, for she had covered her face, which isn't typical, actually, for prostitutes to do. They wouldn't normally do that. Um, he turned to her at the roadside and said, "Come, let me come into you." For he did not know that she was his daughter-in-law. Mm-hmm. She's concealing her identity. We've seen this a thousand times before. Not a thousand, but this concealing of identity, um, and this trickery. And she said, "What will you give me that you may come into me?" He answered, "I will send you a young goat from the flock." And she said. If you give me a pledge until you send it, and he said, what pledge shall I give you? And she replied, your signet, your cord, and your staff that is in your hand. So this is like giving someone your driver's license. Yeah, totally. Like Tim Mackey says, this is the equivalent of handing over your driver's license, your birth certificate, your social security number, like everything that validates who you are, Mm -hmm. your authority, your identity. This is a terrible your, decision. Your bank account number. Or or you could say that it is the equivalent of handing over your birthright for a bowl of mm. soup. Mm. Yeah, but you see him making these hasty decisions. People keep doing this over and over again. Mm-hmm. They're handing over things that should be precious to them yeah. for like this immediate gratification. Man. It's, it's crazy. like what, what do we what do we really value, you know? Do we uh, value yeah. what's right in front of us or do we value you know, these this, these spiritual promises or blessings or yeah. ideas. and Yeah. Man. So he gave them to her. He went into her and she conceived by him. Then she arose and went away, taking off her veil. She put on the garments of her widowhood. So she didn't just like completely abandon everything She and say, oh, this is what I'm going to do now. Mm. She was very intentional about about what she was doing and why. Yeah. And um, then when Judah sent the young goat by his friend, the Adulamite, you know, Hira, the really good um, influence. Yeah, um, the wingman. To, yeah, to take back the pledge from the woman's hand. He did not find her. Um, so yeah, he sent him to do his dirty work. And he asked the men of the place, where is this cult prostitute who was at the Anaim roadside? And they said, no cult prostitute has ever been here. So he returned to Judah and said, I have not found her. Also, the men of the place said, no cult prostitute has been here. Hmm. And Judah replied, let her keep the things as her own or we shall be laughed at. So Judah here, he's avoiding shame. Hmm. Like he's he's self He's all about that self-preservation. Yeah. He's preserving his last son. He's preserving like his sh- his honor. We'll see. And so, and he says, "You see, I sent this young goat, and you didn't find her. Like I tried. Oh well. Yeah. So, <laughs> and then about three months later, <laughs> um, Judah was told." Tamar, your daughter-in-law, has been immoral. Moreover, she is pregnant by immorality. So notice, Tamar is told something. She takes immediate action. Judah is told something about Tamar. He takes immediate action. And he says, bring her out. Let her be burned. Like like he knows 
exactly what should be done. And she, as she was being brought out, she sent word to her father-in-law, by the man to whom these belong, I am pregnant. And she said, please identify, please identify whose these are, the signet like, and the cord and the staff, yeah. do it. Yeah. I have in my notes, boom, roasted. <laughs> I don't know. Okay, sorry. I mean, no, that's good. It's, it's a big true. moment. Yeah. It is. I mean, she got him. She got him. Yeah, it happened. <laughs> so then Judah identified them and said, She is more righteous hmm. than I. Whoa. Yeah. This is a big deal. Since I did not give her to my son, Shayla, and he did not know her again. Do you guys have any thoughts about this? What do you guys think about this? Him identifying her as more righteous. I just found that it always comes back. You know, he tried to avoid and avoid and avoid, like you said, and keep self-preservation. But it, funny, it always comes back to bite us. Mm. Mm. Yeah, he couldn't, he can't run away. He can't run away from it. And strangely enough, it actually turns out to be like it not in his favor but really it does it doesn't make any sense we tend to focus on the actions of tamar mm-hmm. but judah this guy he's not a good guy no he's really not yeah i think I, whenever i whenever i had this uh, the she's more righteous than i it was like it's it's kind of hard to be it's kind of hard to not be more righteous yeah. you know, than you, it yeah. sounds like. Yeah, absolutely. So we see when the time of her labor came, there were twins, like, like Jacob and Esau. We right. see this idea of twins in her womb. And when she was in labor, one put out a hand, and the midwife took and tied a scarlet thread on his hand, saying, this one came out first. But as he drew back his hand, behold, his brother came out, and she said, what a breach you have made for yourself. Therefore, his name was called Perez. Afterward, his brother came out with a scarlet thread on his hand, and his name was called Zara. Mm. So in your study guide, one of the last questions we, we asked was for you to flip forward to um, Matthew chapter 1 and to read what's there. So I'm going to do that for us right now. And um, it says this, this is the genealogy of Jesus. And so we're going to unpack this. This is so unlikely, but again, the way God does things, so he elects people for the good of the many, mm-hmm. and um, his favoritism isn't to the exclusion, but the wow. inclusion of of others. And so... Um, Verse 1 says, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Judah, and his brothers, and Judah the father of Perez, and Zerah by Tamar, and Perez the father of Hezron, and Hezron the father of Ram. So we know this is the genealogy of Jesus, and Judah is in it. Mm. Judah's in it. Yeah. And and it's again, it's Perez, which is interesting because he is the second born, and it's just totally not not what we would expect, right? Not what we expect at all. So, um, yeah, yeah. it. I mean, it reminds me. I think it's in First Corinthians where Paul's talking and says that God uses the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, yeah, the, the unlikely people of the world. Oh my to, gosh, to do His plans, and you know, Tamar's in the genealogy of, of our savior. Yeah. Yeah, she is. The, the second born son. And, she and, is. And even Judah, who's not the firstborn. No. Who's not the, the I mean, I think that narrative. like if we look at this based if we're looking at this based on behavior alone, yeah. these people are like they're not pious. They're, like, they're not, not doing yeah. They're, <laughs> they're not, not the the good guys. They're not doing a great job. Yeah. Yeah. At being like, yeah, who we would think they should be. And but. yet who comes from them but Christ. Yeah. Yeah. It's like he's the point all mm. along. <laughs> it's pretty cool. I I think you Casey, 
I think you said it really good earlier. You said that God uses us in spite of us or through our failures. And I think that that's exactly what, what this is. Like he's using all of that in spite of what they did, all the sneakery, all the, you know, Mm -hmm. withholding for specific reasons or not. I think that that statement that you said earlier tonight is spot on for this. Yeah, absolutely, Lacey. I totally agree with you. That's true. And I like I like the word sneakery. Yeah. So <laughs> like God uses this the like the deception of other people, I mean, to bring about his his plans and his purposes. Yeah. He's steadfast. He's faithful. He is. He is. Even He's, in our sneakery. Even in our sneakery. Yeah. Very, very faithful. So um yeah. So next week, we jump right back into Joseph. Mm-hmm. So, but this is what I would challenge you guys to do. Take a look back at this, see how God worked in this. And then as we're reading the remainder of this, of Genesis, mm-hmm. look at 38 and say, hmm, did that, is that really like, do you see this compressed idea of God, like of this narrative fitting over the overarching narrative of Joseph. It's pretty cool when you when you take a little bit of time to think about it. So, Caleb, do you want to pray for us yeah. as we wrap up tonight? Yeah, okay. I'd, I'd love to. Okay, awesome. Lord, we love you. We are so thankful that we get to study Scripture, we get to read Scripture in community, that we have people who spend time approaching these texts and saying, Lord, what what does this have to say for us? Lord, who are you? What is your character? How faithful are you? God, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that. God, I pray that as we continue through the rest of the study, you only, you only continue to reveal your character and reveal yourself to us that so we may worship you and know you better, Lord. Help us approach these texts in community. Help us approach these texts humbly and ready to see you. It's in Jesus' name that we say, amen.